Hello, this is Alan Murphy, the pastor of New Barn Christian Fellowship in Dartford in the UK. Um, we've been looking at a series uh, of women in the Bible and taking the Hebrew words uh, in some of the passages and developing them and seeing what God has got to say uh, to us through those words. Last week we looked at Hannah and I thought we would carry on with Hannah this week. Um, we saw that her name meant grace and that that meant that God had favoured her and blessed her. But we saw the dilemma of that uh, as opposed to the fact that she couldn't bear any children. But she did eventually. She bore Samuel and we saw that she bore Samuel when she did, because what we brought out from the passage was that she was actually ready to bear Samuel at that point, whereas before she wasn't. And so the timing of God in all these things and in our lives is really, really important. God doesn't always give us what we want when we want. And uh, we have to be patient and learn things because God is not just after giving us what we want. He is after molding us and shaping us into um, more of the person of Jesus. So uh, we are back into 1 Samuel, if you have a Bible, at 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we were looking at uh, some of the verses from, um, or really the verses up to about verse 20 of chapter 1, and I wanted to read from verse 21 of 1 Samuel 1. And it says, when the man Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow. Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy that Samuel is weaned. I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Verse 23. Do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband, told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an effort of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to uh, Eli, and she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he shall be given over to the Lord and he worshipped the Lord there. So we here we have a situation where um, Hannah has been praying for Samuel and earlier on as we saw uh, last week she vowed she made a promise to God that if the Lord opened her womb and gave her Samuel she would give him back to the Lord um, I don't know what you think about making bargains with God but this was uh, a bargain this was a negotiation this is something that she that she put before the Lord and and I think actually that's legitimate I really do not all things we read in the Bible we should copy. Uh, they're, they're not there just for us to copy. They're there for us to learn spiritual truths. Um, she doesn't dictate to God. She hasn't got the wrong attitude, although she did have previously. Uh, she was bitter and uh, didn't have a right heart towards uh, others. But she's come to a position now where, as we saw last week, she stood up. Her spirit stood up inside and she decided to go about it in a different way. And um, so we're going to look at a couple of words. And the first word I wanted to look at 
was um, a word that's mentioned five times actually in the passage that we've just read and that's the word to wean w-e-a-n to wean now the hebrew word is gamal you can see at the top there g-a-m-a-l gamal and it means to wean or to ripen all right now that is really really an important word for us to understand now the weaning process uh, in biblical times uh, children were weaned and that means they they came off the breast from uh, from the age of of three upwards okay so a lot longer than probably uh, we would experience certainly in the UK and in Genesis, in fact, uh, when when Isaac, it's Genesis 21, verse 8, we read that Isaac was weaned and um, Abraham threw a party. It says they had a great feast. So weaning in the Bible had within it, within its context and with its meaning, uh, a lot more importance than we would ever give it today. And in addition to, to ripen and to develop, um, I read somewhere that, that one def definition was to become a person. So there was a sense in which you were growing up and um, I mean, we might say that it's at the age of 18, you become an adult and you begin to make your own decisions. But when you think of things that have happened in your life and things that have happened in my life, you can see a weaning process going on. So weaning is where you're coming off the breast and you are maturing and you are developing so that you're not having the, the mother's milk anymore, but you're going on to solid food. That's the idea behind weaning and when you think of of when we are growing up one of the things that i suppose is every child's joy is when they start riding a bike uh, they have stabilizers at the back and i remember that very very well with my own children you you have stabilizers and off they go and and they can't fall over and then you take the stabilizers off and you put your hand on the back of the saddle and they ride the bike without stabilizers but you are holding the saddle and the next stage and, and i remember it very clearly is you almost push them on the bike and off they go and they're cycling now obviously stopping and starting are, is another um step if you like uh, but they begin to develop. They've, they don't need stabilizers anymore. Um, you get a situation, don't you, when you have children, and in my case, grandchildren, and uh, they're in a high chair, aren't they, around the table. And then comes the time when they're not in the high chair anymore. They begin to sit on a chair. And the stages, they go from a high chair to an ordinary chair but then they sit on possibly a booster seat then the booster seat goes uh, and then they might sit on a couple of cushions then the couple of cushions go and then they are sitting on the chair feeding yourself is another one isn't it you are being fed but you reach a point when you can feed yourself tying your shoelaces something really really difficult when you're growing up as a child and so all these things are being done to you and being done for you but you come to a place and that is a part of development it's a part of growing up it's natural it has to happen it should happen because you are learning to do things for yourself you are becoming more independent 
And so that's what the concept of to ripen is all about. That's that's the gamal. That's the weaning process. In uh, Acts chapter five, uh, there is a situation where the apostles again have been brought before the authorities and they've been questioned and, uh, you know, they've been punished and told not to speak about the name of Jesus. And there's a man called Gamaliel, Gamal, Gamal is in his name, Gamaliel, Gamaliel. And uh, what he does is he says to the authorities, he says, well, lots of people have, have risen up like Jesus. Lots of uh, charismatic leaders who have had lots of people following them. But they died and the people scattered, the followers scattered. But this man, this man is different. Uh, he has died and they claim that he has risen again from the dead and his followers are still around. In fact, they're multiplying. And he says to them, he says, look, you've got to be careful how you treat these people, lest you be seen to be fighting against God. And what he's doing is he's weaning them off. He's trying to get them to change their mindset from what they were thinking initially to now thinking in a different light. That is Gamal. That's the ripening process. And you take anything, you, you take fruit that needs to ripen, you know, you, you take tomatoes which are green or bananas which are green, and then the green tomatoes ripen to red and the green bananas ripen to yellow. When something is ripe, it is ready. So when you were weaned, you were ready to move on. And there's a really, really important spiritual lesson there for you and for me when we look at Samuel and when we look at Hannah's um, voluntary giving him over to the Lord um, and be because she she needed to to go through that process of weaning. He needed to go through that process of weaning for his own good. And so you look at your, your own life. And you think, OK, well, is there an element of weaning in my life? Am I developing? Am I growing? Am I coming off of this and going on to something different? Am I coming off the, the milk of the word, as it says in the New Testament? And am I going on to look at the meat of the word? Am I a shallow Christian or am I going deeper? And these are questions that we need to ask ourselves in the light of this word Gamal, in the light of Samuel's experience, in the light of his mother's experience of going through this weaning process. And when I look at my own life, my own Christian life, I became a Christian in November 1970 at the age of 16 and and this is just what happened to me this is not boasting or I didn't make it up or I wasn't trained or anything this is just what happened to me and I became a Christian on the on a Saturday in November 1970 and within I think about a week or two weeks um, I was visiting hospitals uh, with a couple of other people from the church and I was praying for people, uh, singing to them with my guitar uh, and, and preaching uh, and just telling them about Jesus. And that's when I was 16. And within a few months of becoming a Christian, I was uh, uh, leading a, a Sunday school class. So I had a, a group of uh, five or six children. So I was involved in Sunday school. And then when I was 17, I, 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 we didn't have a pastor at that time. So I would take, I would speak at the midweek Bible study meetings. And I didn't know a lot about the Bible, but I, I devoured the Bible. As soon as I became a Christian, I, I just read the Bible and, and I got to learn it and to know it. Uh, and the Lord enabled me 
to be able to communicate the word of God. So that was a, a, a 17 midweek. Um, and then when I was 18, I was speaking on a Sunday uh, in church uh, again because we didn't have a minister. So there was lots of opportunity to do that. And then at 21, I, I became um, a deacon in the Baptist church. And then later on, I became an elder. And at the age of 32, I went into full time Christian work as a pastor. So I can see, I can measure my development. I can measure the process of Gamal in my life. I can see that there's a ripening and a developing and a maturing process going on in my life. Now that is not unique to me. I believe we can all measure our spiritual progress. Uh, you will recall when, when Jesus was young um, in Luke 2 and 41 to 52, you'll remember it well, that uh, as the parents were, were, were going back home, uh, so uh, he he managed to escape <laughs> and he was in the temple answering questions, asking questions and all that sort of thing. And, and he was only about 12 at the time. And it says right at the end, it says, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God uh, and men. Jesus grew. He was developing. And you need to ask yourself the question this morning as to whether and how you are developing. And it's really important that you can see some change. It's really important that the, the change that's happening, it, it, it can be measured. Um, you may read the Bible, a lot of Christians read the Bible, uh, but they don't understand what they're reading. And they don't take the time to to listen to, to the Holy Spirit and, and to research and to study and to memorize and to meditate to actually get deeper into the word of God. So your Bible study uh, or your Bible times can mature and develop. Your prayer times can mature and develop. You speaking and witnessing to what Jesus has done in your life can mature and develop. And so that's really, really important um, that you ask yourselves those questions. And um, so that's Gamal. Oh, we're going to move on now because we've been nearly 20 minutes on that word. Uh, Gamal to ripen, to develop. And the story goes on. Uh, right at the end that we read, uh, she says in verse, this is Hannah again, in verse 28, because actually we're looking at Hannah, but there's a mix with looking at Samuel, of course. Verse 28, so now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He shall be given over to the Lord. And, uh, and this is the heart of his mother. And you know, when you've got parents like that who are godly and who have prayed for you, I mean, what an amazing start in life you get. And um, praise God for my parents. They didn't know the Lord. I didn't have a Christian upbringing at all. But God still saved me. So you may not have had and you may not have a Christian influence from your parents. But that doesn't mean to say you cannot serve the Lord and walk in the spirit of Gamal. Walk in the spirit of this next word that we're going to look at. She says that he shall be given over. Now, the word given over uh, in Hebrew is natan. That means, means to give over, to offer uh, or to give up. Natan. Now we would call it, we would just call it Nathan. All right, Nathan. <laughs> N A T H A N to offer, to give up, or to give over. 
Now, this is quite something, isn't it? For Hannah, who for years has been desperate, who for years had a closed up womb, uh, who for years suffered um, irritation uh, from Panina and, and was so low and, well, so disappointed with, with, with the whole thing. And then the Lord gives her uh, Samuel. And here she is saying, well, thank you, Lord. But now I'm going to give him back to you. And that is a tremendous thing to do, really, that whatever God has given to you and given to me, part of your development as a Christian, part of your development as a disciple of Jesus, where you're seeking to grow and to and to get stronger and to get closer to the Lord is we are able to give things to him. We are able to give up things to him, perhaps things which have meant so much to us, things which are dear to our hearts. Uh, over the years, I've I've often prayed to the Lord and, and I've said, Lord, my children, I've got four children, wonderful children uh, and, and eight grandchildren. And I've often said to the Lord, Lord, my children are on the altar. I give them to you uh, at some point in their life. They've all given their lives to Jesus, but not all, all of them are walking on with the Lord. But I've given them to God and I've laid them and put them on the altar. And, you know, I, I believe and I've always believed that the altar is actually the safest place to be. Now, it's a place of death. It's a place of suffering. Um, and you think, well, how can that be? How can that be the safest place to be? Well, it's the safest place to be because you have totally given over either your children or a thing or a habit or your life. And that's what we've done, haven't we? When we've given our life to Jesus, we've laid ourselves on the altar. We have died to ourself because we want to live for him. And so the whole thing of the altar, the whole thing of dying to ourselves, the whole thing of giving up, like um, Hannah gave up and gave over and offered. She natarned, she nathaned, if you like, um, Samuel to the Lord. Now, this time on the uh, 10th of March, we are into Lent. And you will know that at Lent time, it's a 40 day period uh, leading up to Easter. And the thought is that people should give up certain things. Some people give up chocolate, they give up sweets, they might give up a particular hobby they've got, they might give up social media, but, uh, and you don't have to do this by any means, some people do. And what it represents really is the, the suffering of Jesus in the desert, in the wilderness for 40 days, the temptation uh, that he went through. And so people, that's where it comes from. So we're in a, a time of Lent where people are giving up things. And, and that fits in really well with what Hannah says. For his whole life, he shall be given over to the Lord. Now, when she took him to uh, this place, when she took him to see Samuel, OK, when she took him there, um, she wasn't going to see him anymore every day. She, she wasn't going to do that. Whenever they went up to offer sacrifices, and our passage indicates that it was at least once a year. And it says a bit later on, she would make him a little ephod, a little jacket to wear. Can you imagine the sacrifice? Can you imagine the separation? The, the fact that she didn't see him every day. I mean, we didn't have, they didn't have phones in those days where you could do Skype or, or, or video calls or anything like that. She just didn't didn't see 
him. That was part of the giving up. That was part of the sacrifice. And the lesson for you and for me is that if we're looking at Bible characters like Hannah, as we are, women of the Bible, as we have been looking at and as we will continue to look at, the things they do in their lives have to be an inspiration to us. They have to be a challenge to us. We have to see that God is trying to teach us a lesson through Hannah. And the lesson that is being taught through Hannah is that Hannah gets Samuel. This is her first child and the most precious possession that she has, if we can call a child a possession or treasure or blessing. And she's giving it away to the Lord, giving it back, giving him back to the Lord. And of course, that's where our dedication as service comes from, isn't it? You know, where we dedicate our child back to the Lord. And, you know, you, you think of your life and, and you think of, well, I've given my life to Jesus. So I gave my life to Jesus. But how is that working out? How is that panning out? Am I constantly in a spirit of sacrifice? Am I constantly in a place where I'm holding on lightly to the things of the world? I'm holding on lightly to my home, to my children, to my uh, career, to, to all those things. I'm holding them all lightly because actually they all belong to the Lord. My children and your children <coughs> belong to God primarily. And he has given us, hasn't he, our children to look after them for him. They are, in a sense, on loan. And uh, and so you look at your life and, and this is what we should be doing in the light of what God is trying to teach us through the life of Hannah. And you might be thinking, well, Lord, is there anything that I'm holding on to dearly that I shouldn't be? Is there anything that is part of my life that, that's so, so important, that's so precious? I remember when I gave my life to Jesus at the age of 16, I... I used to play football for my school. I played football for my borough. Uh, I trained with Leighton Orion and Spurs. Um, so I was going in the right direction, I suppose, uh, to become. I was only a six months or a year away from signing uh, for, for Leighton Orient, actually. And, um, but you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't in my own heart give my life to Jesus and play football on a Sunday morning uh, when I felt I needed to be in church. So that was it. Football had to go. And, you know, God softened my heart and he changed my heart. So I didn't hold football up there. Football was down there and he was up there. And you, you just need to ask yourself the question. You know, on a Sunday morning, I know that we haven't been able to meet in churches for nearly a year now. Um, but when we get back to meeting in churches, will you will you be a part of fellowship uh, with Christians or will you be doing other things? Will you be going out for the day? Will you be playing football or cricket or whatever it is? And you just need to examine your life like we all do, like I did and like I do and think, well, Lord, are there things which I need to give up for you? Are there? Are there? And, and, and just pray about that and ask the Lord to touch um your heart by his holy spirit there's a couple of um uh, situations i want or just a couple of people really I, I want to mention to you in closing and you will have heard of these many of you would have done but the first one is uh, a chap called jim elliott uh, who was around in the 1950s and uh, well a bit earlier as well and um but he was, I think, 28 when he died. He died in 1956 and he was a missionary uh, to some tribes, some Indians in Ecuador. And there was him and four others uh, and they went to this um, settlement uh, where these Indians were living and they wanted to take the gospel 
they wanted to tell Jesus uh, about you know to, to these Indians um, and they started off and, and it was all going well and um, you may know the story uh, the, the the journey if you like or the vision or the missionary sort of thrust at that time was called Operation Oka, A-U-C-A, the Oka Indians. And in the end, they were all murdered uh, and they were found floating in the river. Very, very tragic. Uh, he had one, I think it was one daughter, who was only about one, 18 months or something like that. And um, he had a wife. Uh, as did the others, I believe. Um, he gave up everything because he loved Jesus so much. Now, God doesn't call us all to go to Ecuador or any other country. In fact, he calls some, but he doesn't call everyone. But can you see, it's the spirit of all that. It's not actually getting on a plane and going to another country, although some do. But it's the spirit of that. Lord, I am willing to tell others about Jesus. I am willing to go wherever you want me to go. And if it doesn't involve travel, Lord, I'm willing to tell my next door neighbour about Jesus. You see, the principle is the same. God has given you good news and he wants you to give that to someone else. He gave Jim Elliot good news and they were giving it to the Oka Indians at the cost of their lives. And there was another uh, a chap, it was in the late 1880s, called C.T. Studd. And he was a cricketer and he played for his county and uh, he played for England too. He had a number of caps for England. And uh, he was a missionary in China and in Africa. Um, he wasn't murdered for his faith, uh, but he did die. Um, while he was serving the Lord uh, abroad and again it was someone who could have carried on being a, a cricketer could have carried on and had fame and fortune and all that sort of thing but but people who have given their lives uh, to Jesus and um, there's a couple of quotes that I, I just want to leave you with um, Jim Elliot said, the first person we, we spoke about, said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And C.T. Studd uh, said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. You know, a number of people over the years have uh, become Christians. And when I've spoken to them about being baptised, they've said, oh, no, I can't be baptised. I'm too shy. I can't do this. I'm, you know, that's not me. And I've said to them, well, just consider the fact that Jesus died on the cross for you. And so you being baptised and going under the water and saying a, a couple of minutes testimony, what is that compared to what Jesus has done for you? Uh, and I just want to leave you with, with that thought, really, that, that Hannah, Hannah gave up the most precious person that she, she had. She gave up her child for service to uh, follow God and to serve God and others that's what God our Heavenly Father has done for us he's given up his child he gave up Jesus uh, for a life of service to save us and in the light of that in the light of what Hannah did in the light of what God, our Heavenly Father, has done, where do you stand as regards of your own life? And it may be that you're not even a Christian. You've never given your life to Jesus. Well, give your life to him, because if you give your life to him, he will transform you. You will never be the same 
again. Well, the Lord bless you. It's exactly 35 minutes now. So I'm going to close there. Uh, we may be looking at Hannah again next week uh, in chapter two, but we'll be certainly looking at another lady in our Bible. So God bless you. I hope you feel you've been blessed by what we've been looking at. And I'll see you next week. OK, bye bye. Bye bye.